What is up, everybody? Welcome to the inaugural episode of Tacit Thoughts, a percussion podcast by myself and Chris Nadeau. Hope you enjoy. Episode one, Caleb Pickering. We've got Chris Nadeau, who's over in Fort Collins. How you doing? Good. How are y'all? Pretty all right. And today we have Delaney Armstrong, who I actually met in 2016, I believe, or 2017, at Adams State University. Uh, she's actually from what I found out is Spokane, Washington, not Spokane. Uh, she was a part of the Spokane Thunder Drum and Bugle Corps. Uh, she's currently studying with Dr. James Doyle, who's a good friend of both mine and Chris's, at Adams State University in Alamosa, Colorado. She's a music business and percussion performance major. Uh, she's a great musician, talented drum set player, is an advocate for equity in music, and gave a fantastic presentation at the ASU titled uh, The Stage Gap, Perceptions of Female Percussionists in a Male-Dominated Industry. Most recently, she completed an internship with Beatle Percussion. Company Chris actually just joined as one of their artists, and uh, I'm a big fan of their pads as well. Uh, and Delaney also just won a scholarship through the Grip Tape Learning Challenge project, which I believe is going to help her fund how to use a recording studio. Is that right? Yeah, actually, like learning how to build my own recording studio. Wow, that's so, that's hip. Yeah. What? So what all is the Grip Tape? That's really interesting. I hadn't heard of that. It's actually a national program, and it works from. 15 to 19 year olds and basically it's contributing contributing to the idea that the American education system somehow sometimes doesn't coincide what with what everybody wants to learn so example kids are going to school every day and it's more like a job you know you're there for eight hours a day and you know they're being not necessarily like forced to learn but it might not be something that they're actually interested in so grip tape allows these students to really delve deep into something they're very interested in. So they give them a grant of up to $500 and they can really pursue anything that piques their interest or anything they want to pursue later in their career. Uh, so they, they're still in school, but they do extra funding to go out what they're passionate about? Yes, the whole point is, is that like, there's like no adults. So there's this thing called Youth Squad, which you log into, and it's like all the other people who are also challengers, and you can talk to these other kids, and <laughs> and uh, basically, even like the committee, they once the people get too old, they'll like boot them off the committee, because it's really generated around the youth. And so you're only supposed to have about a third of what you're learning be school-related, or something like that so for instance i'm going to be taking a recording class next semester but like that's going to be like the only thing that's going to be school related so you also did an internship with beetle how'd you get involved with with beetle i assume maybe through james actually it was through jack fry i met him first because i took lessons from him right and then he got an internship there and he was like hey check out this company they're really cool and then i bought a practice pad through them and you know i kind of knew about them and then as i was as like after i sent in my auditions for um all the colleges i auditioned for i was looking through their artists and i was like james doyle what that's so weird i didn't know like it was just like out of the blue and so i showed up to school with my beetle percussion pad he was like you know about beetle it's like so it all just like came full circle wow. i knew jack dr doyle and then got connected with them and yeah, just, I was really interested. What'd you do over there uh, this summer? Yeah, so first, um, Jack taught me pretty much everything he could before he had to leave for the Colts and teching at the Colts. He, I learned about how they do, how they take their photos. Um, I learned a little bit about the marketing, how they put the website. That was like some of the first things I learned. And then I actually learned a lot about woodworking and how they actually go about making the pads. So all the processes and all the sanding, so much sanding and all, all the rubber and just, yeah. And I ended up with all my fingers. So. Oh, good. Yeah. 
That was one of the biggest things. Doyle was like, if you don't come back with all of your fingers, you're dead to me. <laughs> I'm gonna say I have, my grandfather lost his two fingers doing woodworking. It's not a good, not a good situation. That, that's a cool company, though. I didn't really know about them until I got here. Um, I think I'd seen them before a couple of times through social media back in Dallas. But uh, it was just kind of—it's a really cool company, especially when you get to like this part of Colorado where you see a lot of the beetle killed pine trees out in the area still, and seeing them actually working to you know reuse that material that's kind of unusable at this moment, and then help with the reforestation, which is really neat because there's the connection again. That's always funny is that getting here at Colorado State, where I just finished my master's, found out that they actually used the CSU forest roof department to work through for their wood chipping and a replanting, I believe. So when I know they're talking about uh, doing some uh, more planning projects up here actually in Fort Collins, which would be neat. Wow, yeah, that's cool. So everything they use is recycled, right? Yeah. Yeah. Man, good for them. Yeah, they, they, they make a great product. I'm, I'm really happy with my pad that I have. So enough with all this internship music business talk. Let's get to destabilizing the patriarchy of America. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That was actually my, uh, when I was doing my presentation, that was like one of my first jokes. I was like, they only gave me 20, 20 minutes to dismantle the patriarchy. That's good. I remember that. Yeah. Can you give us just a brief overview of what your presentation was and your research was? Yes, absolutely. So I had three main goals. Um, the first one was to talk about the gender stereotypes in the percussion industry. Um, I wanted to talk about the over-sexualization of women in the percussion industry. And um, finally, just to, uh, oh, I, to see upcoming women in the percussion industry and to bring awareness to the persisting sexism and importance of representation to hopefully bring change. That was... That was like the overlying goal. I remember in, I think it was in the stereotypes part, talking about how there's very rarely girls on the drum line or in the percussion section in general. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that's absolutely true. And then I remember in high school, I think we were a fifth, like a 50-50 split male to female ratio. And then Chris taught at a school, Plano West, which if you want to talk about your experience there, Chris, it was... You had a well, whole lot of girls in that program. I, I, yeah, we did have a whole lot of girls. Before that, I thought the interesting one was uh, when I was in undergrad, I teched at a tiny East Texas school for a friend. Uh, they had the most peculiar situation ever seen. Uh, it wasn't a particularly drum, big drum line. I think it was usually like four snares, two tenors, four or five basses, maybe like three, four marimbas, two vibes, stuff like that. I think including front ensemble and battery, there were maybe four guys like the entire drum line, I think the whole snare line, but one was girls. Uh, the center, the center snare was also one of the cheer captains, and that was the first time I think I was really ever aware of how like male dominated the situation was because I was completely caught off guard, and then I just it was a really great learning experience for me. But uh, like I just kind of came in there, I was like, oh wow. <laughs> but uh, no, Plano West was an interesting one because. And again, great kids loved them all to death. Uh, there was a kind of a history of like that kind of male dominance in the drum line there. Uh, but there was the whole, we had it before, there, there's a, like an old school thought, like some of the guys had the thinking is like girls just belong in the front. And uh, they kind of were openly, they, they, they were pretty verbal about it sometimes, which caused some student teacher interactions. But, uh, but I just remember there was a couple of the girls that were really bothered by it. And they had talked to me, and they addressed it to me, and I was just like, beat them. Uh, so we had a couple of the cocky kids who were generally good kids, but again, just they had that attitude, thought they were going to walk in, make drumline captain. And then, again, we had four of our five bases turned out girls. Uh, we had a couple of girls make the snare line. We had a girl make the tenor line, stuff like that. So it was just kind of one of those things where the guys had to kind of wake up and realize that those girls could totally drum. And that was coincidentally the best bass line we ever had. Yeah, that's, I mean, I'm, the Plano West and the uh, the Willis Point situation is, that's definitely a rarity. It's def that's not the, the norm. Delaney had a really good point. You were talking about your experience at uh, Spokane, Spokane Thunder, and then it reminded me so much 
I won't say the person's name just because to keep anonymity, but somebody posted recently on Facebook about, you know, Mass and Scouts, Cavaliers, it's time to, like, what are you doing? Just, like, let them in. Like, let them in. Why not? What are you, like, what are you waiting for? Yeah. And then, why not? Sure. But the out, and I assume that the majority of people would agree, but the outpouring of negativity was, like, disgustingly... It was I was I just couldn't believe how much I read, but it always came down to uh, somebody saying, you know, well there's gr- Santa Clara or whoever has a girl on the snare line, and it's just like what that's that's one. There's yeah. there's like there's like twenty people on the line. That's a two point five percent rate. That's not enough. <laughs> Can you talk mm-hmm. a little bit about that if you don't mind? Yeah. So first of all, I remember I. I pulled a statistic because I actually, when I, before I did the presentation, I, I don't remember what it was and I wish I would have had it, but I went back and I looked at all the DCI course and that you're like all like the top, like top 20, I think. And I actually counted all the girls in the drum line and it was so, so underwhelming and just so, so small. And you're looking at it and pretty much it's like, you got the girl that's on base one or base two, or, you know, she's, like, on the snare line, and that's, like, it. Like, I I don't think I've really ever seen a girl in DCI March tenors, for example, and it's just so rare to see that. And then you do, like, because uh, I've been there, and I've, I've marched snare line and just been the only girl in a drum line, and it's, like, you get there, and then it's still, like, like in my experience, I was talked down to a lot, for example, my drum tech would explain everything to the entire drum line and then look directly at me and say the same thing over again. Like I didn't understand it the first time. Or it, it was just like, it felt like he was just constantly trying to explain things so I would understand it, you know? Hmm. Um, we were all rookies. It was just an open class core. We were all rookies. We were all just there having fun. And so it wasn't like really anyone had more experience with DCI than anyone else in the drum line. Um, so, yeah, it's, it feels like you just work so hard and then you're still dealing with the same thing that you dealt with from day one, not even to mention like the sexual assault and sexual harassment, um, that you see in that too, just because yeah. it's so male dominated. Um, I know, for example, when the Me Too movement was happening, um, I'm part of a group on Facebook called the Female and Female Percussionists. Shoot, I don't remember the actual full name, but it's like a group for female female percussionists. And when that was happening, to just seeing all the posts, it's like it was just like me too, me too, me too, me too, me too, and uh, and just so many experiences in DCI. And what what core was it that actually just had a bunch of women come out and say that Cadets, they were that. so much just has gotten covered up in DCI and everything. I thought it was I, I thought it was interesting when the Me Too movement came out because I talked with a couple of people that we were kind of immediately like, oh, this is going to take a moment, but it's going to hit DCI pretty hard. And I think it, it's, it's it's interesting to see like the dynamics it's created with some like you've had a couple of like small people, like student based or staff people, kind of get the slap on the wrist, and then there's been a couple of notable names that have come down from it. It's been really interesting to see like the backlash that that movement's gotten too. Like uh, it's just like the the absolute unwillingness to accept that that's a problem Uh, because one of the big figures uh, that got removed from their situation, there is a group on Facebook that I found of people that are pretty determined that it's just a witch hunt and that it's just trying to pull down a major name. And it's just like, who are you going to believe? The one guy who says he didn't do it or like the huge number of growing people that are saying, yeah, I had a problem with this. And, uh, yeah. But it, I think that kind of goes back towards that, that situation we talked about, like uh, the Scouts and Cavaliers. It's just people have their mindset of, like, this is tradition, this is just how it is, get over it. And that kind of translates pretty well into the problems we have just in the whole social environment in the country right now. And yeah. so you've got the progressive people moving forward trying to say it's, some of this is not okay, a lot of this is not okay, and there's other people who are saying it's, it's not a problem at all. I just think that's such a weird dynamic to kind of see mess uh mix and match right now yeah i had one term so i had to look this one up because it's a a part of uh, adam state university where you go they have that mission for equity 
across the board, which is part of your presentation. Uh, so I did some research earlier just because the term equity versus equality, and I feel like a lot of people think they're interchangeable, and I often think that those two words are interchangeable, but I definitely had to look it up. And so I kind of put together a short, uh, super rudimentary explanation for anyone that's unclear. So we're all familiar with the playground model of fairness, which is basically I get to play with the ball for 10 minutes, Chris gets to play for the ball for 10 minutes, Delaney gets to play for the ball 10 minutes. That's fair. That's, um, again, that's really a rudimentary explanation of equality, not equity, but equality from equal. So equality aims to promote fairness, but involves starting with the presumption that we're all starting from the same spot. Uh, and it only works if everyone starts from the same spot. Uh, on the other hand, equity, which is what Adam State and most of these movements are based off of, a lot of people think it's unfair, and this is where a lot of that backlash comes from, because it's really, it might look unfair if you're starting at a point of advantage or privilege. It totally isn't. So equity uh, moves everyone closer to success by leveling the playing field, more or less. So another elementary example is to say we're in a grade school classroom, and we have to read a short story and answer questions about it. If the instructions are the fr on the front page are printed there and say we all read the instructions and one student gets to put on headphones and listen to the instruction read to them, that is equity. So that person might have a reading disability and they need the instructions given to them in another way. But there's always going to be those one or two students that get upset and say, well, you know, this person gets to listen to, why can't I listen to it? And it's just like, well, you don't have that equity, or you'd, sorry, you don't have that disability. So in short, equity is giving everyone what they need to be successful, while equality is treating everyone as the same. So I know that's really rudimentary, but you can draw the parallels to race, gender, any social issue uh, you feel. But I did have to look that up because I feel like news sources and everyone really interchange those two pretty frequently, but they're definitely, they couldn't be farther apart. Yeah, that's all part of um, Adam State's ethos progress, progress, ethos project. It's the equity through music project. Um, we start first started in the band program where we did music compositions um, based around the San Luis Valley and the culture there. And we had a few student composers participate in that. And then the choir program, the uh, vocal program, they did something called, it's something having to do with the immigrant's journey and about the life of an immigrant in the United States, which was really beautiful and just, it was, it was amazing. Um, so we're hoping to do more with that as well, involving equity, Adams. Cannot remember the person's name. You can Google it, you'll, you'll find it really quick. I'm having trouble finding their name or his name, but he definitely created a fully operational women composers database. A oh. lot of my friends, and James Doyle included, is really good about programming, uh, like they did the all-female composer concert. Uh, but I think he tries to put in at least one or two pieces by women or people of color per concert if he can. Uh, also, this one doesn't come up often, but it's the issue of, uh, man, it can just be sometimes tough to to find like I've, I was thinking about like man I wonder if I could do an all recital of female composers and it's totally possible but it's like man it's you yeah, to it dig is, for it. it's so much yeah. harder I'm doing that for my junior recital actually um, I have all my pieces picked out but yeah I was just like digging through YouTube forever and and then you look online and you know that's why we think it's so valuable to champion these like women's music or, um, you know, a minority's music because if they have a composition that's so awesome and so cool and they don't have a video or an audio if nobody's played it before, that's so hard because I'm not going to go, I can't go out and spend money on a piece that I don't know what it sounds like if I don't like it or if it doesn't work or what's going on. So that's why we think it's so important to like champion these people's music because who else is going to do it? But it also... Um, Dr. Doyle started a database of women composers, um, 
we did. I did a, a graduate seminar class over American music literature, which was really just an American music culture, and then really at the core, just American culture. But we had a pretty long segment where we actually talked about that. And there was another database done by somebody. They're compiling a full like like whether it's uh, instrumental, chamber, uh, wind band, orchestral, uh, just any any combination of like female composers. Uh, African American composers like this, all these kind of unknown, because like we, we got to the heavy to the subject of we always play like the same names, whether no matter which group you're in, because we, we discovered it's like orchestra, you're always playing the hits. And there's there's problems where why you ha- why you have to and why you can't, depending on the size of your orchestra and the funding. Sometimes you have to play to who's paying you. Um, uh, then you get to like wind bands, uh, especially in like school programs where it's kind of a similar issue. Sometimes it particularly in like grade school, you tend to play a lot towards like your, like in Texas, the PML list or like the whatever list you have. And that doesn't ever really change a whole lot uh, or at least enough to make it more diverse. Uh, but then we, we even talked about it. I was starting thinking, you know, percussion, like you, who are the people that we play a whole lot of? And there's the big popular ones right now. Like right now, everybody's playing something by Ivan Trevino or, you know, Casey Cangelosi stuff sells like crazy. Uh I think Caleb sold a piece or two in the past five years. Not a single, uh, not a single one. <laughs> but it, and then like you know, there's people, there's like clarinetists in the class that were kind of saying the same thing. That it's like you know, we just kind of tend to play the same literature or the same composers over and over again. And when you think your composer list is big and diverse, you kind of really write it down and look at it, and you're like, well, it's really not. It's just a whole bunch of whole bunch of old white guys. <laughs> yeah, that was my music lit class. I remember. <laughs> into my freshman year and I was so excited to take Muse 100 and (laughs) our piano teacher he teaches that class Dr. Doyle also teaches that class and Mrs. Dr. Doyle also teaches that class and um, I took it with him I had no idea he is very traditional very um, Amadeus Mozart is a god among men (laughs) and it was so central around just like old white men. It was pretty frustrating. I think we didn't even cover jazz or anything. Nothing like that. You know? Yeah. We'd be listening to some of this obscure, I think we were like listening to music around the time of like uh, Charles Ives and stuff. And there was like several female composers that came up that had music that was really innovative, different for the time out there and pushing the envelope and like that we would never listen to. And she's like, well, I'm finding these performances. I think it was like Seattle symphonies played them or like, you know, like all these other like bigger people have played this work, but it just doesn't stay in the modern repertoire. And so then she would just kind of jokingly think, should I throw this in my music history class? See what they, (laughs) yeah, I mean, why not? I know. I feel like that's the current trend for what will be, I guess, Chris and I's, or I guess our generation, we're not that all far apart in age. Uh, but yeah, when our age of people are professors, I feel like we'll have more, uh, just more, I guess more people of color and more female composers, just because, I mean, when you think about, why do we only play dead white guy music? Well, who was really popular in society for the past 2,000 years? Yeah. It's just like, okay, well, now it kind of makes sense. And then you just get stuck in the cycle, but now the cycle's kind of crumbling a little bit. So hopefully it just keeps going on. There was, um, I saw a lot of mixed feelings about this. Con- uh, it was a composition contest, I think in the UK. Uh, I might be wrong. I'll just say it was three rounds. I assume it was three rounds. Round one, if you were a woman, person of color, basically if you were anything that wasn't a white man, you were passed on to round two. And a lot of people got really, really upset about that. That's equity in application. Because, I mean, it's kind of like, you can't just say, all right, you know what, let's all just be equal starting now. All right, ready, go. We're all equal. And it's just like, well, yeah, but you have a thousand-year head start. So it doesn't really balance out. I'm sure. You know how the um, how the process went, like, as the listeners? Who were judging? You know how that was went? Was it like blind? You know? I don't know. I wish I knew more, but I don't. It's like even if they did make it to the second round, if it was if it was just a bad composition, you know, they're just yeah, right. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, and that's totally fair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you made it to round two, but if it's not a good piece and if it's a blind listening, then 
that's a level playing field for sure. There's no bias at all. There can't be. If you're yeah. Just by sound alone. That's a totally good point. You actually brought up something really good and I never thought of until I YouTubed it myself. Can you talk about the best female drummer search? Yeah. So first of all, you have to clarify best female drummer because if you look up best drummer, it's just all guys. It's just a sausage fest. So, <laughs> so when you specifically look up best female drummer, I think, I don't know, for some reason, YouTube thinks best and hottest are like the same word or something. I don't know. But you get, you get all these videos that are like hottest female drummers. And like, first of all, there's just a bunch of clickbait and just a bunch of girls with like just wearing a bra sitting at a drum set. And so there's like, sure, that girl might be good, but she doesn't really represent female percussionists or female drum set players as like a whole. Because like, why would it not be like a picture of Annika Nillis or something? Like I watched some of the videos and some of the girls on the cover, they weren't even in the video. Yeah. So first of all, click play. And then you watch them and it's just a bunch of girls who are playing like metal music and you know, they're wearing almost nothing, and it's really just, it's not even geared towards women, it's geared towards men, these videos, yeah. you know, and you look at, if you look at some of the things where it's like, if you're watching a video of like the best drummers, and you have, you know, um, Elvin Jones, and Dave Garibaldi, and you know, whatever, it's like, they're seriously talking about they're playing and their sound and, you know, maybe how they tune drums or like serious things that percussionists think about. And then you look at the YouTube comments on the other videos and it's like, wow, that girl's so hot. Or for example, on the um, female percussions page I'm on, this girl was posted um, on Drum Talk TV. She was, it was her solo and they posted her video. And one of the guys said, I bet she's really good at giving handies. And these are like other drummers. And it's like, Ah, oh, why? Why does this happen? Because you know she sees that too. And well, there was, um, and I don't think it was intentional that he pointed this out. Maybe it was, but uh, there is a there's a drummer that I watch on YouTube every now and then. But he's kind of like the Ryan Reynolds of drums to me with his personality. But it's a guy named I think it's Harry Meyer, Harry Meyer or Harry Myrie. I can't remember his name, but uh, he uh, he was he did his uh, artist. He made his own artist video for joining uh, Minel. Uh, so instead of them making one, he insisted he made it. And so he does his jokingly about, like, he's going to review the company. He's going to do the background knowledge research, everything on it. And so then he jokes. He's like, I'm going to read Facebook comments. And uh, so he starts going through, like, their list of artists. But he gets to Annika at one point, And, like, he points that out. Like, like, like there's just such an extreme aggression from all these guys about she sucks. She doesn't even sound good. But, like, it's, there, there's no, like, like – uh, critique i guess but there, there's no real critique after that it's just them trashing on her and even the other people that they're kind of trashing on some of them are absurd but like the guys get a little bit more like a reason why they don't like them it's just annika was just she's just garbage that's why and he jokes about that and then shows videos of her just killing it but yeah I, that that was the one that kind of stuck to me real quick when you were saying that yeah i've seen that too it's like i i, I remember seeing this video of a girl she was just like had such a clean pocket like she wasn't doing anything super intricate but it sounded so so good and just like all these guys in the comments were like she can't even she's like she's not even good she's just got all these views because she's a girl blah, 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 blah. and like i'm just like she sounds good you don't have to like be elvin jones to be good at playing drum set and it just seems like every all the guys are so quick to just jump on that and be like oh she's not even that good yeah, Pocket Queen. I love Pocket yeah. Queen. Yeah, she's great. I guess it's just time to just call them out. I mean, we did the same thing with Neboja Zivkovic. Oh, I mean, I was gonna I have, I, Honestly, I have no problem talking about him just because, yeah. The, I mean, I've heard him say things in person that if, they, if there was that much outrage over Facebook, then these things, he would be, like, shot into the sun. <laughs> yeah, it's just... Reese put some pretty out there stuff on Facebook to the point where I I unfollowed him at one point. I was like, I can't see this anymore. So did I. It's just it's ridiculous. Well, I think it's I think I think it is interesting the way we kind of look at the the female percussionist in different settings. I mean, like because you have it in like the drum set settings, a big one. Any drum set girl that's 
like that gets up there and is even remotely good is going to get trashed from like a comment section of people that might not even actually be drumming. Um, the, I think the only time we see percussionists that aren't like female percussionists that aren't ripped apart for some for no reason whatsoever, it's always mallet percussion. And exactly. I feel like. Yeah, I feel like that's the place because, you know, no one ever trashes. Well, I mean, nobody really gets aggressive towards like Keiko Wabe, Katarzyna Michka, uh, Lynn Vartan, anybody. Uh, I, I always think of uh, Evelyn Glinney. There's uh, w whether you like her playing or not, commissioned or had commissions of more concerto work done for her than anybody I can think of. I've heard some pretty aggressive things said towards Evelyn Glinney that don't have any other basis based other than maybe she, just because she's a female percussionist that's just heavily in the mainstream. Yeah, like you were um, talking about, I, in my presentation I talk a lot about like the Malik girl is the same girl just everywhere and she's, you can like see a sea of guys doing um, a percussion ensemble piece of any sort and you can like see her like in the back, she's like playing vibes or marimba or something or it's just this idea that marimba is more feminine of an instrument and that, I mean, I've heard guys say that drums are just masculine and women are feminine, so they can't play drums well. That's just how it is, and which is entirely untrue. There's feminine and masculine sides to marimba and snare drum and drum set. You know, they need, it's very necessary to have both and in our perceptions of masculinity and femininity as a society. But I know one of my good buddies called someone out a few years ago, like in person, after they did something in a rehearsal, uh, like to one of the girl students, it said that there's the thing of if you call someone out and then everybody jumps on board, you can like, yeah, we can push that person out. But there's also the fear if you're the person getting harassed, the career bubble is so small, it's like, okay... I don't want, you know, whatever the guy at, or the guy that recently came under fire. Like, I don't want him to torch my career. And then they yeah. just, yeah, it's really unfortunate. Yeah. Um, I was reading uh, in the Facebook page, a woman had said that her entire career at the moment was based off of this one guy and he could like totally just ruin her career. And he had a very traditional sense of masculinity and femininity and what women should and shouldn't do in percussion. And she was really frustrated because, you know, that's not how she wanted to go about things. And her entire career was on this, this one guy at that moment. And mm. it's, mm. Hard. Yeah, that's that's, suck. that's a downer. Yeah, sorry to sorry to bring it down, but I guess that's. Uh, you actually brought the statistic. I wrote it down because I was so like shocked by it that uh, women in the music industry two percent are college professors and five percent are in professional level orchestras. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, the professors is technically lower. You're, that's counting also not technically like professors that's also counting um, women who are just there to maybe do some teaching as like an assistant or um, really just anything regarding teaching at the uh, collegiate level so it's even less than that as professors and then 5% yeah that's just ridiculous and it really hasn't grown over the past 30 four years no, according yeah. to the society and I mean, I guess I guess it wouldn't if you think those people sit in those jobs until they're old enough to retire or they die. So now we have, hopefully, I guess the the trend will be in twenty years is that the that generation has moved out. And not all of them are bad, but that generation is out. The younger people are in, and then it just kind of blends, and we have a little bit better representation. So composition XX. I actually, I actually named it was our con our concert that we did as a percussion studio where we did only compositions by female composers, in, which is very hard to find in percussion ensemble. And um, uh, we didn't want it to be like, oh, girl, composer concert, because 
kind of wanted people to figure that out on their own because that's also it seems very almost like you're taking three steps forward but two steps back as well because you know we constantly go to concerts that are all male gen like all male oriented so it's making this concert in particular see like an anomaly pretty much for round for three muses yeah that piece was awesome i love that piece it was so funny because when I was performing it, there were a lot of kids in the audience. In the beginning, it's so quiet and really dark. So all the kids were like, why is it so quiet? And then their parents would be like, shh. And they're like, I am being quiet. And I could like hear them the whole time. <laughs> but um, yeah, I love that piece. It was I got to sing in that piece and play mallets, which I honestly don't do too often. And it was really cool. It just had like this like shredding mallet part and but it was so drum oriented as well and just very singing and bowing on gongs and cymbals and it was just a really really incredible piece yeah do you speaking of the, the composer oh andrew clearfield andrew yeah. yeah yeah it was incredible singing a high g um above the staff and hitting drums was incredibly difficult <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I actually just saw Escape Ten a few days ago, and they played a new piece by Michael Burrett and Andrea Vinay plays and sings at the same time, and it's just like it's it might not be high high, but it's you know it's high enough if you're not a regular singer, and like it was just so loud, and she was like playing so loud, it was just such a cool moment. I wish I wish I had both the capability and the confidence to sing because I, I that's like one of my biggest fears in life I think I, I think the only time I've ever had to do any vocal work in a piece was like in high school playing was it sacrificial right and like little freshman me was terrified and my prof my college teacher always got on to me because I wasn't singing like everybody else but I think it's like the mallet lab that was starting like the uh, marimba and singing challenge oh. on Instagram I think the whole trend going of like trying to share videos of people playing either covers or originals or anything like that where they're playing mallets and singing at the same time, just kind of recognizing the the difficulty of playing both or doing both at the same time. But I thought that was an interesting one because you're starting to see a lot of a lot of like younger students, like high school age students that are doing it really well. And it just kind of blows my mind because I'm like, I, I can count and play at the same time. But like to have like the rhythmic capability of like playing something while moving around the instrument and like singing different rhythms is just like mind blowing to me. It actually it helps it's honestly easier for me to sing um while i'm like playing something like marimba like i do a lot of vocal warm-ups while i'm playing marimba tense up a lot when i play marimba it helps me keep really loose and it helps me keep very open and like helps my breathing be really low um but yeah it's it's really interesting once you start it's kind of hard because it feels like you're thinking about a lot at one time it's really fun it's like one of my favorite things to do I'm doing a piece by Julie Spencer called Everybody Talks About Freedom. It's oh, like a, yes. it's like, yeah, and uh, yeah. Um, there's some singing. It's just like an insane piece, and it's like crazy. It makes me laugh. I love it. It's just so cool. Like when that piece is good, it's so good. Yeah. yeah. To music, I think of Lynn Vartan's, uh, one of her recent albums that she did was the, uh, I know it starts off with Grotales and like uh, Soundscape and then goes to Marimba, but it's over the track. That, yeah, in the fire conflict. There it is. Thank you. That was a really cool piece, though. I saw her do that at California a few years back, and that was just like, I think that was my first ex time really seeing the mix of the two, and I was just like blown away from it. Do you have any, I know this is a loaded, a loaded big question, but do you have any suggestions or thoughts or changes you would like to see in regards to your presentation in the community? Like anything you would like to see, especially the predominant white male populace of the percussion world change or do to help, I guess, move things along? Uh, well, I would love to see, first of all, more representation because in my head, it's proven that representation helps so much. For example, in my high school, there were like almost no female percussionists and I was the only one and I was, you know, I was a pretty pretty good drum set player. I love playing drum set for the pep band and everything. And in my community, 
everybody like loved watching me play drum set. They would always walk up to me to like, I don't like come to these games to watch you play and like all these other things and like, which was so awesome for me and so humbling for me. And but after that, I didn't realize what I was doing for the fifth and sixth grade bands because the amount of girls that started that wanted to play percussion, it it increased by like two hundred percent. I mean, we went from having almost no girls in percussion to the majority of the girls in percussion and only a few guys here. So that was so cool for me to see and understanding that the more representation we have, the better. And the, it needs to be good representation too and not like how the media portrays. I remember seeing a Hit Like a Girl ad, like one of the first ones I ever saw. And the girl, you could tell she didn't even play drums. Like the way she was holding the sticks, I was like, why don't you actually get a real female percussionist to just pose for you? I mean, it's just so frustrating to see and then like you see them over sexualized and everything. So first of all, more representation, more media representation and um, in the right way, I think is one of the biggest things is what I would love to see. Um, and as far as helping improve, just listening and understanding that yeah right now you might be ignorant and that's okay it's okay to have to be ignorant it's okay to accept that but you need to listen and think about like where you are in your life what you've done and just like you know check yourself be like am i doing something am i doing this wrong like what can i do to be better um because i i do that every day i'm thinking what because sometimes i'll have some a thought in my head that's not necessarily, you know, right. And it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily okay to think and be like, okay, well, why did I think that? Let's go back to the root. Like what, where did that thought stem from? And just trying to move on from it and trying to be better as a society and as, you know, percussion, percussionists everywhere. Um, for example, our percussion studio, we're very keen on the, um, not using male only gendering which is a huge thing everywhere. For example, when someone just says, you guys, um, we use, we sound like we're from Texas because we all say y'all, you all. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, all the time. I never thought as a person from Washington state that I would be saying y'all as much as I do now. Um, but it's, <laughs> Dr. Doyle really cracks down on it. Every time someone says you guys, he'll be like, y'all, <laughs> and just, <laughs> really tries to get that into our heads and because it's something you don't really think about until you know you're experiencing it because I didn't really think about it either I was like wow it is so male oriented in the way we speak and the way we talk so those are the things I would like to see and just my experiences with it how to make music industry better as a whole yeah yeah that's solid I'm glad that people used to make fun of y'all, but now yes. it's coming back with with uh, with good representation. So, just a little fun question, just out of curiosity: current music you're listening to, or any fun binge-worthy shows or books we should know about? I didn't add books. I feel like I should talk about books because I'm a, trying to be a doctor and stuff. <laughs> but I'd rather watch Netflix. I'm just gonna be honest. Netflix. I'm watching Supergirl. Um... I, I don't know. I've never really been like into superheroes, but I started watching Supergirl and I just love it. It's so cheesy and I love everything about it. Oh, that's um, awesome. I haven't and seen I just, it yet. Yeah, it's really good. And Jeremy Jordan's in it. He's He was he played the main character in Newsies on Broadway. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, cool. And then I just, I binge watched Queer Eye as <laughs> fast as possible. Oh yeah. The new one on Netflix? Yeah. Brad. Man. Stop. That's I've been uh, I've been right. watching um, Scrubs, the the comedy show Scrubs. And I was telling Chris this the other day. I mean, it was early two thousands is when that show came out, and a lot of the issues and jokes they talk about, kind of ring true today. But then some of the stuff they blow over and they like cadence the episode is like, okay, this is resolved. Like, they have an ex episode about sexual harassment. And then it ends with, like, this guy trying to touch this girl's butt. And the old doctor walks over and hits his hands. And he's like, no, 
we look, but we don't touch. And it's just kind of like, ooh, I don't know. Uh, I don't think that episode's going to fly anymore. I think we got to... Right. Uh, yeah, that one's... We're going to have to make a, an addendum to Scrubs. Um, <laughs> man, yeah, thanks for sharing these... Thanks for saying. I say man a lot now that you got me thinking about it. Like I just cadence sentences like the beginning with like, oh man, yeah, and I just start. I gotta work on. Those are the three words you say more than anything. Ah, man, and yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say. I think I get yeah from Casey. Um, yeah, yeah. Thing. Oh, I said it twice just then. I just said yeah twice. I gotta work on it. Thing with YOLO making fun of YOLO, and then I would just say it ironically so much that I started saying it, and I'm like, oh, no. Yep. <laughs> okay, this is, a con- this is a condition. Okay, we've brought up a whole new issue with my personality and my persona I gotta work on. But, yeah, Delaney, thank you so much for joining. It was it's so cool to get a different look at, at some of these issues. Presentation, for anyone that didn't see it, it's on YouTube. If you just YouTube search, uh, just Delaney Armstrong ASU, it's one of the first hits. 20 minute presentation, so it doesn't take too much of your day. And it, yeah, it goes through so many good things that we talked about. And yeah, I would just I would just keep going with it. Just you know, take it a step further if you have to do a senior project or anything. Or yeah, I hope, hope you get to do more cool stuff with all this research that you're doing. Yeah, next time we'll have, there I go again with another yeah. You're the worst, Christopher. Um, so next time we'll be uh, talking with Cameron Leach. Again, thanks Delaney, and we'll catch y'all next time.